Welcome to the weekly webinar with Rabbi Pincha Lundstein. This is Josh Wander from Yushalayim. Happy Hanukkah to everyone around the world, and thank you for joining us. Rabbi Winston is running a few minutes late, actually. He just showed up in the studio right now, so perfect timing. Welcome, Rabbi Winston. This is uh, entitled Rags to Riches, and uh, I was just saying to everyone that uh, you were running a little bit late, but uh, perfect timing. And uh, it's sponsored by bringthemhome.org.il. Um, also, uh, Rabbi Winston's uh, um, a website, which is 36.org, and uh, Israel365. So without further ado, uh, here's Rabbi Winston. Thank you very much. Um, it's a remarkable you know, Cinderella story, so to speak, as they, they, I guess they call them. Somebody who goes from literally nothing and becomes second in command of Egypt. It's, a, it's not the kind of thing that happens every day or happens very often in history for that matter. But uh, it's a, is it really teaches much about our own personal lives or just we're just watching what happens to one particular person and his his success story. We we see this people in, in history, even in the business world, for example, who start with absolutely nothing, and then they are able to accomplish so much in such a short period of time. And you see a lot of stuff with Mazel. Mazel, you know, usually is translated as destiny, meaning it's kind of in the cards for the person. Everybody's got a personal Mazel, uh, personal destiny in life. And even though the Talmud does say that a Jew is able to rise above their Mazel, for the most part it means we can mitigate it. We can't actually change our muzzle completely, contrary to popular thought, that uh, it, a certain amount does have to take place, but we can mitigate it, meaning that we can make it better, or, God forbid, we can make it worse, even. And there's certain examples in the Talmud, that type of a thing, but but you know, if a person is you know doing what they're supposed to be doing, if a person's on track, they're on the same page as God, they're, they're with the program, you know, and they, and you have to understand what that means, too. But particularly, particularly if you're somebody who is geula oriented, you're redemption oriented. That's a very, very important key factor in Yosef's story, because we see from the very beginning that he is somebody who, you know, he's thinking about about the bigger picture. He's someone who's, who's focused on, you know, how he can somehow play a major role, and he feels destined to play a major role. And certainly, his dreams played into that. But uh, you know, you know. What did he have to do anything, you know, specifically to to get to become the kind of a person, or was this just natural? Was just his, you know, his muzzle? Was it just, you know, the way he was created, the way he was born, certain type of soul? Because we know that soul natures do make a difference in terms of what we do in life and what we accomplish in life. They they certainly affect the our our uh, our attitude and reaction to things. Some people have a certain soul that is very hard to be patient, very hard to, you know, to. To be able to uh, you know, be consistent and and to stay with something, I know that personally for the for, for many years of my life, uh, I had a kind of reputation grow up in my house as somebody who would begin something wouldn't finish it. I would just lose interest at some point in time. On the other hand, I would take apart trains, you know, to see how they worked and understand that. And uh, it wasn't until much later on in life I began to write books and you know focus on other projects that not only did I stay with things, but I, for years I would stay with something. And I realized after because because a lot of things just didn't make you know they they were meaningful to me uh, at that stage of life either because they weren't meaningful in, in general or I had yet to appreciate how they were important what they could do for me and then as you grow up you mature so you start to you know focus and and you know we know what our goals are supposed to be or at least we work on those goals we come up with goals and we learn to discipline ourselves the people who have a nature who can be very lazy by nature. There's basically two two natures in life. One is called chesed, one is called gvur. Chesed, you may recognize the word, means kindness, but it's a certain type of light. It, it, kindness is the expression of this, this idea of chesed. And there's a gvur so, which means strength, but it's more like a constricting type reality. You know, so for example, you find people in life who are very generous with their time, they're very generous in, in general, and they're patient, but on the other hand, they also might not be so motivated to accomplish things. Uh, and then you have other people, for example, who are very disciplined, both on the, in terms of themselves and other people, and they can be very strict and impatient and frustrated, but they get a lot accomplished because of this type of a thing. And that's more of a Gevura-based personality. And a person who has a Chesed-type personality 
who wants to, you know, complete a course in college, for example, or, you know, if they're learning in, in the yeshiva to complete a tractate of Talmud, which takes time and patience, depending how long they are. Uh, and they have to train themselves. They have to, you know, learn to take some of the gavura aspect of, of life and bring that into their life. A, a, quick, a quick comparison or a quick, quick analogy to understand and appreciate, chesed is compared to water. And water just flows everywhere, right? It, you just pour a glass of water on the table. Right? I just put a, uh, a a tarp up over my sukkah you know, frame to try to make an area that's protected from the rain. Unfortunately, the water just comes in. No matter how many boards I put up there, there's, there's always some place where the water collects. And it makes a, a nice little lake. It looks like it's going to break all the beams in the end. On the other hand, water has this capacity to join things together. If you take water and add it to flower, flower is all broken up in small, teensy little pieces. But if you take the water and you put it together with the flower, you get a dough. It can join things together. So chesed is a joining type characteristic. Gvura is compared to fire. And fire burns things. And, you know, you take a piece of wood that was solid, one piece, and you burn it, it starts to become, you know, ashes and cinders. And, you know, and the wood comes along and blows it all away. What was once there is no longer there at all anymore. Uh, on the other hand, the discipline, which is a huge uh part of life, if you want to accomplish things and fulfill your potential, is an aspect of Gavur. So, you know, sometimes you, you marry someone who's the opposite for whatever reason because you feel the need to have this in your life and you get married or you only find it later on that this is the case and you you hopefully, you know, complement each other and bring up, you know, the person who's more chesedic will bring up the Gavur. You, you find this by the forefathers, right? Avram was chesed and Sarah was din. She was judgment. She was Gavur oriented. It was the reverse by Yitzchak and, and Rivka. He was the Gavur. He's the symbol of Gavur Yitzchak. That was his trait specifically. And Rivka is more the Chesed type. Then Yaakov marries two wives. And, and Kabbalistically, Rochel is considered to be more the, the Din aspect. And Leah is more the Chesed aspect. And sometimes you find it's just the opposite. That Rochel is the Chesed aspect and Leah is the Din. You know, but but uh, you know, we're constantly trying to balance ourselves out because you know, we recognize well, someone who doesn't have discipline because they're more chesed oriented, will be either they'll admire the person with discipline, or they'll at least you know even be jealous sometimes of that person because of the discipline. On the other hand, the person who's very gvur oriented is a tough person to be around, and they, they may have no friends. They're the kind of person who everybody in the office talks behind their back and says, "Boy, that guy's nasty. He's a he's a shrewd boss, and he's very hard to work for." You know, they may do what he says, but but you don't make a lot of friends when you're gvur oriented, and and you feel it. The fact that the person has a difficult time connecting with people, uh, even though that's his nature, you, you, everybody needs people. We all need relationships. It's the it's the bread and butter of life. It's what really adds life, you know. And then you know, finding a a, a soulmate may take more time. And and raising kids, you know, that they should grow up with the proper attitude and appreciation of life. A parent has to take into account their personality and how it, how it's affecting their children because because even though we can go in and out of anger as adults we one moment we're angry that we can make up and but kids are affected for the rest of their lives and i think every parent comes to realize it's unfortunately too late and it's it's very hard to, to control but this is the this is the ongoing reality so you know yosef also has a specific type of a trait he, he, his soul is a, is a combination of different aspects but but he's also corresponds to in Kabbalah was called Yesod, and Yesod is one of the Sfirot, which is a conversation unto itself, but it's more of a Geula reality, re reality, and as a result of that, his his mentality is, you know, in that 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 realm, that's where he's living. And the truth is all the Shvatim were, in fact, thinking like that, because the whole reason why they sold Yosef in the first first place was not because they didn't like him. I mean, clearly they were jealous of him at first and they hated him, right? Or they hated him and they became jealous of him, right? And and then they sold him. But the, the rabbis point out that this was not a simple sibling rivalry. These, are, these people were prophets. These people were great, great people, greater than anyone living today, including the greatest of our rabbis in this generation. They were on a whole different level. I mean, God was talking to people at that stage of history, and they were the the, the uh, great-grandchildren of Avraham, the grandchildren of Yitzchak, and their father was Yaakov Avinu. So they were phenomenally elevated people. So they cannot be capable of simple you know, sibling rivalry where 
is not, you know, people, siblings will, will, will be upset with one another. And it's not always because the other person has done something wrong. It's that personalities clash. And I don't like you. That bugs me. That annoys me. That's not the shvati. That's not the shifteka. That's not me. whatever whatever they felt, however they responded to the situation, is because they were looking at the bigger picture. They were thinking Jewish people down the road, the Jewish nation. In fact, the Medrash says that that Yosef per se was not the threat, but his attitude and his his energy they felt would at some point in time lead to the wrong thing like idol worship, like golden calves. Now, it didn't lead to the golden calf that happened at Mount Sinai because that was a bunch of people who got involved with that. But it did eventually lead to golden calves set up by Yeravim Benevat, who came from the tribe of Ephraim, who was from Yosef. And he set up golden calves after the time of King Solomon when the kingdom split into two and it tried to intimidate or at least encourage people not to go down to Jerusalem in the temple. He set up these golden calves. And that was a function of his attitude that they felt would come eventually from Yosef. So they were they were thinking to protect the Jewish people in the future. So that's why they sold Yosef. And and they assumed that God was you know in agreement. In fact, the Medrash says that when they sold Yosef, that they actually made God take an oath that he would not tell Yaakov what they did. How do you impose an oath on God? <laughs> okay, well, you know, you'd ask maybe, but uh, yeah, that's that's interesting. And 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 God didn't, and it wasn't because they told God not to, because it turns out that had God in fact told Yaakov, then the whole situation had been rectified much earlier, and they would not have been the ones with egg on their faces in the end. And at that moment in next week's parsha, when he says, "I need Yosef," and they can't speak because they cannot believe they could have been so wrong about Yosef and about God's you know, connection to Yosef and how he looked at Yosef and the dreams that came true and all the you know, dumbfounded, completely dumbfounded because 22 years had gone by since they sold Yosef and actually it was 22 years, yeah, 22 years had gone by since they sold Joseph. And uh, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of water under the bridge going the wrong direction in the end. So what does it mean they impose an oath on God? Well, God says, listen, you know, you think you're doing the right thing. Did you check it out? Why haven't you spoken to your father to see why he feels this way? And, you know, you know, you take things into your own hands. Look what happened already. In Shechem, you went in there and you wiped out all the men. Almost cost us the future of the Jewish people because after that, the Canaanites came to go to war against us. And the only reason why we were able to save ourselves because a miracle happened to protect us. And that's because you went ahead and did your own thing. The same thing, you know, with Yosef. You, you know, you went ahead and did the same thing. You know, Yaakov doesn't know that yet, but it's going to come out later. In fact, the moment in the Parsha, this week's Parsha, that's really interesting because, because you can kind of feel the shift, right? What do I mean by the shift? I mean that, that basically you, know, you have a moment where it seems like Yaakov has been pushed out has been pushed out of the picture, right? He's been pushed out of the picture and and you no longer control the situation. And uh, and the brothers take over. You know, they take over in Shechem, they take over in Yosef, and like they're the, they're the ones in charge now. But everything goes awry. Everything goes wrong. Shechem is, Shechem is a disaster, and, and the, you know, what happened with the with uh, Yosef ends up being a disaster in the end. So when they find, as the story starts to unfold, and Yosef starts to do this thing, so, you know, they go vote. Let's let's pick up the story and and the, the narrative and see what actually happens. So, eventually, once Yosef comes out of jail and he interprets the dreams of Pharaoh properly, and Pharaoh says, "Yes, this makes a lot of sense to me," and and you are definitely innocent of your adultery charges, and 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 you're a great person to lead this country and prepare us for the, um, the upcoming famine that you're talking about. Once all that happened, now he's now he's the vice president of the United States of Egypt. Sorry, but uh, he's now you know, in the, his, his proper position. And um, and then the, the famine begins, because that's what it's all about. The, this whole story is about the brothers coming down. I mean, we have to rewind. This whole thing happens because God told Avraham back in his time 
that the Jewish people, his descendants, would go into a land, a foreign land, not theirs for 400 years. It didn't have to be Egypt, but it ended up being Egypt in the end. There's kind of not a lot of choices at that time, but but it ended up being Egypt, and this is all to fulfill that prophecy. They had to go down. So Yosef has his dreams. He gets sold because of the dreams, goes down to Egypt, goes into jail. You know, you can read the, the, the Torah itself. It's a good idea. And, um, and now he's in position, so now the famine begins. And Yaakov sends his sons down, and they go down. There's 10 brothers. Benjamin does not go down because of what happened to Yosef. And the 10 brothers stand before Yosef. He accuses them of being Miraglim. He says, you're spies. Well, first it says he recognized, well, he remembered his dreams. Now, it's interesting. He forgot his, about his dreams, apparently, because he now seeing his brothers, it was only once he saw his brothers that he realized that this is the fulfillment of his dreams. Uh, because, because why? Because they're bowing down to him. That's what the dreams, up until now, to become vice was one thing, but to actually bow down like the dreams foretold, now this it brought the dreams to light and to life. And it says he recognized them, but they didn't recognize him. And then it says he recognized them again after that because the, to indicate the fact that, that they could not see Yosef in the viceroy. Now, it could be the Gemara says because he had a beard now, but usually a person who goes at the age of 17 years of age, you know, by 17, your facial features are pretty much formed. You get, you look older and you can change, but 22 years is not that much of a change. Now you have a beard, it's going to hide. Well, you know, Egyptians dressed a certain way and he probably also dressed the part and maybe they even had makeup on at that time. But the real reason why they couldn't recognize him because it was just too far fetched as far as they were concerned. They have they didn't get the they haven't got the message yet. It was too far fetched that that this would be Yosef, even though he had the dreams. But don't forget those dreams were twenty two years old, going back a long time. So a lot of you know time has passed since they had to deal with those dreams. So putting two and two together was not so easy to do. But Yosef was trying to help them. That's the whole thing. He's trying to help them. And he says, Moraglim with him. And the word Moraglim, interesting enough, actually, each of the letters of the word stand for other words. So Moraglim is, is Mem, Resh, Gimel, Lamad, Yud, Mem. And the Mem stands for Mi'imi, which means from my mother. The Resh, of course, is Rochel. My, 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 you know, that's Mi'imi Rochel, my mother Rochel, right? Genavtem, you stole me, kidnapped me, right? The Midianim. Because that's what the Torah says. First, he was sold to the Midianites who were passing through, Yishmaelim, and they then sold him to the Arabs, you know, to the you know, at that time the Egyptians. You know, Mechartan, you sold me. So he's talking in code. Now, code usually only works, you know, if the other side's expecting the code. If someone starts talking to in weird words, at least words that make sense, but the, the context doesn't make sense, the other side's saying, Is that a code? Is he talking in code? Is vice rate for some reason, like you know, is this like more code or something? What, you know, what's this Maragli? They only hear the word Maragli. Spies. And, and and it fits inside the context, right? For sure. You know, you 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 know, he's he's accusing him and he explains himself. You came to spy the land, you know. So they're only hearing that they actually are, are being accused of spies. And it's very interesting because the result points out that there was also a deeper, more Kabbalistic, Kabbalistic meaning in all of this, and that is that that uh, Yosef was saying that later on you will reincarnate into the spies of Moshe's time who actually will go out and spy the land, and if you don't fix up what led to this situation, then you will have a problem later on in that situation. And they did we're still in exile because of the spies of Moshe's time, and Yosef's trying to fix up this problem back then. So, what is Yosef doing by it? Why, why is he, you know, he, you know, hinting in such a way that it's almost impossible for anyone to figure out that people have learned Chumash for thousands of years now who don't know about this hint? Is it really true? What you know, what's happening? So, you know, there's other things too. What happens is that you know after. After Yosef accuses them of spies and they start to spill the beans that they're really you know, 11 brothers and one's back home and one went missing. There were really 12 brothers originally and one went missing and one, you know, you know, is back home. And so Yosef then sets up this fantastic finale by saying that I will believe you if you go back home and bring back that little brother because he wants to put them through the whole thing all over again. He wants to bring out a perspective that, that they haven't had until now. They haven't had it at all. They won't have it until maybe perhaps the next week's Parsha. And the truth is they never completely get it. And it's tied to Hanukkah. 
as well, because tonight is the eighth night of Hanukkah, Zos Hanukkah. And the word Zos in Kabbalah usually alludes to a certain level of intellectual, spiritual clarity. The kind you can say, that's God. You can point with your finger and say, that's God. Zach, Kaylee, Van Bale, they actually see and and it's it's palpable, the reality of God to such a degree, you're 100% clear. My Rosh Shiva used to refer to as five finger clarity. Just like you can look at your head and say, yes, there are five fingers or four fingers and one thumb, right? I can see that it's not clear to me. Likewise, your knowledge of God has to be the same as well. You have to be that clear. Can't be any doubt left over because the Yetzirah and Amalek and the Sitrach, whatever you want to call it, takes advantage of the doubt. You cannot be made to sin where you are clear about truth. We tend to make the mistakes where we're in doubt. And sometimes we're not even sure that we are in doubt. We're in doubt about being in doubt. But the Sitra Achra, the Yitzhahara, figures it out. You have a situation, and all of a sudden, you know, you, you're confronted and you know, you start to waver. And only later on, after making the mistake, do you say, you know, I really shouldn't have done that. I, I don't know what was, I was thinking at the time, what came over me, but that's what that's what happens. That's how a chet takes place. But in the meantime, right? So Yosef is giving them all kinds of clues because he's testing them. He wants to see what's happened until now. He's softening them up. He's changing them. He's putting them through the situation the same way that they got rid of him because they thought he was a danger to the, the, the future of the Jewish people. He was doing this to them to make sure that they didn't interrupt or, or cause problems to the future of the Jewish people because if we start dealing with one another the way they were dealing with Yosef, the nation's never going to survive. And we have a lot of those problems. We have for thousands of years now. We've had civil wars, even. You know, they are, and, and the way to find out where they're holding is to put them through all of this. And that's why you find there's one major turning point in the entire Parsha where, where first of all, when, when Yaakov says to the brothers, when they go back, I left that, near, that part of the story out, they go back home after leaving behind Shimon and Yaakov, they tell the story about the money in the bags and all that. And eventually they have to go back again. And and uh, Yehuda says to Yaakov, he says, listen, he, he told us that we cannot go back. We cannot see his face if we don't bring, bring back Binyamin. So Yaakov says, well, why, why did you have to even tell him about Binyamin? And Yehuda says, oh, what do you mean? This man knew everything. I mean, so many things about us. He even knew that the wood that our cribs were made from. Well, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Boker Tov, you know, it's like uh, divination, maybe. Do we believe in stuff like that? Well, yeah, I mean, back in those days, black magic was real. Today it's, you know, hocus pocus, but, but back there it was, it was a real reality. You could work through the side of impurity to accomplish Kabbalistic things. I mean, that's really what black magic really was. It was Kabbalah without the connection to God, which is the problem. Real Kabbalah, it's, it's clear that it's God doing it, but you're acting as a conduit for his light. And it makes it holy in the end. And and Yaakov is picking up. It's it's kind of indicate. You can kind of see how it's possible that that uh, Yaakov is aware of what's actually going on. You know, at that time. he see, senses that Yosef is probably alive and well down in Mitzrayim. And when he finally has to acquiesce and let Benjamin go down to Egypt with the brothers, so then you know, he says, "Well, if we're going to do it." Here's how we're gonna do it on my terms. The way I, you know, you can feel him take back the power from his sons. The sons have tried to take over the business and almost ran it into the ground. And now Yaka says, Well, that's it. I'm coming out of retirement and I'm going back into power. I'm gonna be the leader once again. And this here's how here's how we're gonna deal with the situation. Of course, what he does leads to the you know everything. And I it, 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 some people say that Yaakov and Yosef are actually in communication with each other through the, these events. That they're talking, kind of talking to each other. You know that Yosef was hinting that he was alive, and Yaakov was hinting he understood that. And and Yaakov's only concern was not that Yosef was alive, but now was he spiritually intact? Because you're down in the place of the forty-nine levels of spiritual purity. Did he survive? Is he survived the situation? So it plays itself out, and and finally, uh, what happens is basically, you know, Yosef, you know pushes him to a point. And there's one there's one key phrase, you know, in, in the entire story that like indicates the extent to which Yosef's plan is, is succeeding. And that is, 
Reuven says, he says, you see, you see, you know, you know why this is happening to it? You know, like, like God, it's all from God, folks. It's all hashkacha, but it's all divine providence. This is God doing this to us. Yosef, this guy, the viceroy, this Egyptian, whoever he is, is just the means to accomplish this. But you, you know why it's happening to us? They immediately connected with Yosef. They know this is Yosef. What they did to Yosef, this is the reason for that. But, but Reuven adds, he says, he was crying to us, and he was appealing to us, and he was begging us. And it's the first time we hear about this. You know, when this what happens in a movie, imagine a movie, <laughs> you're watching a movie when they kidnap somebody and the sound goes out. You can't hear anything. You not can't hear the talking, can't hear the person, can't hear, you know, the reaction. You know, part of the drama of the kidnapping or whatever is going on is the fact that the person's freaking out. They're having <laughs> literally, uh, you know, they're panicking and screaming and begging and, you know, trying to get away and all that, but it can't hear you because the sound's out. You know, it's like, it's just not, you know. So Yosef is muted. And Parshas Vyeshev, right, he's, he's muted completely. And you hear nothing of what he was saying or feeling. He was probably crying and he was begging them, if not for his own life, because he knew that his father would be torn and 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 to go to pieces to know that Yosef was missing and he cannot, you know, and nothing, nothing. And then now Reuben says, yeah, that's what he was doing, all right. And we didn't listen to that. So now God's doing this to us. It's like, it's almost like getting, you know, a shot, you know, from your the dentist works in your mouth, you know, and he gives you a shot to freeze the area so you won't feel the pain. And then there's a, like a numbness. You can, you can, unfortunately, you can bite your lip, you know, without even knowing it and bleed and the whole thing. And then slowly but gradually, it starts to tingle and you start to feel that it's getting better until finally you get all the feeling back. And, you know, and it, you start to wake up and you start to feel and, and be real with the situation. And that's what's happening now. This is what Yosef is unfreezing them. Now, the truth is, it began to happen earlier in last week's Parsha, because after Yosef went missing, it says that Yaakov could not be consoled. His family tried to console him, and he had a sense that Yosef was still alive. And there's a tradition that if a person is still living, I mean, he's assumed to be dead, but they, the person is actually living, the per people cannot be consoled. The mourning won't end. And it kept going on and on and on. And... You know, Yehuda lost his position, Rashi points out, because of the fact that the brothers realized it was probably a mistake. Well, it probably was a mistake, and Yehuda led them down that path, and therefore they blamed Yehuda for it, and therefore they demoted him in the end and becomes, you know, was, he's separate from everybody because of this whole situation. And uh, they get more and more soft. And they Yosef, on the other hand, the other way around, he, he goes from being, you know, from being, you know, you know, soft to becoming hardened. In, the end. in fact, when we hear Yosef talking to his to his brothers. It's very hard to comprehend how Yosef could do that. Now, if you are a revenge oriented person yourself, then you'll say, "Well, that's exactly what I would do." What Yosef is doing, I would do it too. I'm, I'm viceroy. I, I command the mightiest army in the world at that time. And my brothers have sold me to, up to a river without a paddle, and here they are. <laughs> I'm going to get back at these guys big time. I'm going to put them to the ringer and make them suffer all this. You know. Yeah, but that's not Yosef. Yosef is not vindictive. He was not vindictive. But it's not. It wasn't his thing. You see, you see. Look at look in the parsha. Last week's parsha too. It says that 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 Potiphar relied upon Yosef completely because he was always successful and God was always in his mouth. Yosef was like this with God. He was connected. He was complete. A person who's that connected to God, who believes in divine providence, especially all that he's gone through, and now he's viceroy of Egypt, he knows he's functioning on behalf of God. He says to his brothers later on, you meant to, to, to cause harm to him. That was your kavana. That was your intention in all this. But I know that this was all God's doing. God did it. He brought me down here to make me viceroy so that when the famine came, we would be able to survive. And and, and I'd, I'd be here to set things in motion, to set things up the way it has to be set up. So he's not he's not vindictive. So why is he doing all this stuff? Well, it's not easy, but he had to teach himself that. He had to train himself to be able to do this. In fact, in fact, in fact, in fact, right? You see him cry. When he hears his brothers, they don't know that he understands Hebrew because he has his son, Manasseh, who they don't know, acting as a translator between, you know, Egyptian and Hebrew. So he's acting and well, 
that he could only speak Egyptian. So they're all talking amongst themselves. And he has a conversation. He's all the regret and all the, you know, the, what they're feeling right now. And he starts to cry. It's hard. It's hard for him to, to be able to do this right now. And in fact, my Rosh Hashiva once explained that that his he didn't quite finish his job. He didn't come become hard enough in the end. How do we know this? Because when the brothers are at this point where they they just not getting it, you know, he's just more and more, he's more hints and more hints and more hints, and they're still just not getting it until finally they say, "Well, we're going to go to war." Okay, if that's the way you're going to be, we brought back Benjamin like we promised. You said you let us go. We got a father back up. We've been going through so much already. We our life, you know, and it's like do or die now. So if you're not going to comply with your promise, we are going to fight until the death. If we die in the process, so be it. But we're not going to stand here and go through all this right now. So when Yosef realizes they're just not going to turn, that's when he says, I need Yosef. He can't, you know, it's a peck. He, he, can't, he can't control himself anymore because he just couldn't carry through. But what was supposed to happen was he was supposed to stay with it, stay with the program and keep going down that path. And the brothers were supposed to, at some point in time, say, Atai Yosef. They were supposed to get it. They were supposed to figure it out. Atai Yosef, because that would have meant that they had expanded their minds, that they had been able to grasp the larger picture. And you know, Because ultimately speaking, that's what we all need to do. We all need to buy into the large picture. There's, there's two levels of reality. There's God's reality, the objective reality, and it's, it's, just, it's one, one track mind, but in a godly way. It's either... You know, you know, Gaul is either exile or redemption, and really it's redemption. God has a plan set in motion of creation. Nothing has strayed from that plan. It's all going according to clockwork. And God's leading it. God's guiding it. It's just that, you know, sometimes things happen that way that we can't understand. And the fact that God shares information with us is fantastic. But we, so many things are left out. We have, we have uh, you know, kind of black holes in our, in our knowledge, specifically to leave room for faith. And trust in God because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, what are we trying to accomplish with our lives? You could be sitting and learning Torah all day long. You could be going to a job all day long. You could be working on whatever you're doing with your time, your life. Everybody has the same tafki, the same purpose. And that is to develop a close personal relationship with God that's so deep and so profound that you never get distracted from it for one moment. And that's what Yosef and his brothers are trying to develop because that's what they have to inculcate into the Jewish people, right? As we spoke about, I think we spoke about it here, but right, Yisrael, the namesake of the Jewish people, and Yaakov's new name after fighting with the angel, the angel says, Ki Sarisa im Elohim, or sorry, Sarisa im Elohim, because it's an angel, not God, im Elohim va'anashim v'tuchal. The name Yisrael means you fought with 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 angels and with men and you prevailed that's our name that we fought we're, we're, we're being named because of a battle that we that we fought and we won right i mean there's so many other more spiritual things that we could be you know you know named for that you can say you know compliment us for the fact that we did that but why should the name israel embody that particular idea so what does it mean to prevail? What does that mean? And second of all, why is it that the, the order is reversed? Because normally you go from the least to the, the, the bigger, right? Not only did you fight with man, but you also fought with an angel. Because isn't, isn't it more difficult to fight with an angel than with man? With man, like human beings, they're, they're limited. They're, they're not really necessarily connected to God so clearly, and, and, and they can be overcome, seemingly. And angels are messengers of God. And you can... Fight one if it's even possible. I mean, who fights angels, right? But you can try to fight one if one happens to come across your, you know, your, you know, cross past at some point in time and you get to a struggle. Yaakov fights with an angel, and and that's you know, how do you overcome an angel? He did, but how you do it? Which one's more difficult? Well, the pasuk, the verse says that it's more difficult to fight against men. The angel was the easier part. The fact that it says angels first. So what it means is the following thing. It means the tochal that you, you prevailed means that you never lost sight of the fact that everything was God the entire way through.
every last detail, even the, the things that seemed that were so godless, it was still God in the end. You know, I was almost late for this year. I was about two minutes late. I apologize for that. Uh, one of the reasons why was because I was involved in a mitzvah. You know, I had to go to do something else. And uh, normally the trip home at that time of day is not a problem. It happened to be a rainstorm this afternoon. Uh, the you know, roads are a little more slippery. And of course, about 7, 10, 7, 15, there was a big traffic jam not too far from my turn up, but everything's slowing down completely. Right, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, you know, like of all the times I have to be back at 7:30, you know, you know, and part of you is going, it's Mishnah mine, is this from God? But why would God want me to be late for the shirt? And I was just doing a mitzvah in the process, and it was a mitzvah God would be to be late, the free, you know, and and you know, in, in the end, it was like amazing. At some point in time, the traffic just boom, opened up, and I was able to get off and and be back. Literally, but I thought it would take 20 minutes. Took about in the end of about 10 minutes only, Baruch Hashem. But the entire time. You're trying to, you know, like it's, it's, part of you is saying your yitzhar is telling you that things are under control, and it's not really God. Because if it's God, you have to ask the question: Why has God allowed this to happen to me? Why am I going through all this? You know, you know, and is you know, gams of the tov, and it must be for the good. And I have, but, but most people they don't deal with it. Even religious people who believe in God and believe in Torah, they're not so real with God in every aspect of their life, especially the things that go against them, especially when they're doing things they think should go, you know, the sea should just split. And that's why you know, the traffic should have just said, oh, you need to be back at 730 and teach? Hey, allow us to all pull to the side while you go straight down, you know, without any problems. No one did that. They were cutting me off instead. You know, it's like, you know, like God, he you was know, like, he was all in control. God was doing this the entire time through. There's an end picture. There's something that's coming up. It's not just what's happening right now. So that's what Yaakov was able to do. See, to fight with an angel is easy if the test is to see whether you're still believing it's God. It's kind of hard not to believe this is from God when you're fighting an angel. The angel comes from God. You know, he works for God. He doesn't have a free will choice in all of this. If he's down there fighting you, God sent him. It's clear. So the, the fact that Yaakov was able to overcome the angel, not overcome in the sense of, 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 of military battle, but in terms of not being distracted away from God the entire time. The Shkach HaPratis was real to him. Likewise, you're fighting against other people. Levan, that's different. It's different when you're fighting. It's, it's much more difficult to be focused on, on God when we're talking about human beings who get in our way. An angel, that's from God. But this guy is like a low life, and he's a cheat, and maybe even a murderer. And look what he gets away with, and look what he can do to me. I sit here doing my mitzvahs all the time, Torah, I learn, and I do mitzvahs, you know, and this guy is able to rip me off. This guy is able to endanger my life, can pull off a holocaust. Such an evil person. You know, where is God in all of that? And a lot of people ask that question, and a lot of people have no answers for it. And unfortunately, because of that, people, they left because they couldn't see the hand of God in all of that. And and that's what you know Yaakov was able to do. So Yisrael means that you were able to fight with an angel, and that was the easy part because you saw you know God and all of that. But even with men, people like Shechem, who took your daughter, did this terrible, horrific act, and still see the hand of God and accept the hand of God and all of that, and and prevailed. You prevailed. That's called prevailing. That's the real prevailing. You can win military battles and you can lose military battles. You can win any kind of battle and lose other battles. But the only battle that really counts the, the most is the one to stay focused on God the entire time, to see his hand and all that occurs, and to appreciate that we don't always have the full picture. We have to wait until the end of the movie to see how it's all going to play. That's what Gams of the Tova means. This too is for the good. And that's where brothers seem to fall short. But that's where Yosef excelled. That was his thing. That's what that's what Potiphar says. And Yosef says, how can I, when the wife of Potiphar tries to tempt him, right? And he says, how can I do the sin against God? Now, when a person decides to do a sin, they know it's against God, against Torah, but they're kind of like trying to pretend there's two different realities, like I'll deal with a God one later on. In the meantime, it's me and this, this piece of cake that's not kosher. You know, I was like, but, but not Yosef. It was this, God's right in this room. At the same time that I'm doing, is you're doing this, he's doing this to me through you. He's testing me. You're just a test. 
they lose perspective. And same thing goes to Paro. Pharaoh, you know, Paro says to him, I hear you can interpret dreams. No, not me. I don't do this. It's all God. I'm just the conduit to tell you what you have to hear about this famine. He's completely focused, and that's why he's the Hampshire. He's a continuation of Yaakov, because he's always focused. And he says, you sold me. And most people who would, would have gone through what I went through with you would have clearly, you know, clearly have said that I'm going to get back at you when I get a chance. Not Yosef. He doesn't do that. He says, I understand. This is all God. You're all panicking and worrying that I'm going to take revenge because you're not, not clear about this idea that, you know, that God's in every last single, single moment of our lives. That was a true rags to riches. But yeah, he's going from a slave. Right? He came from a wealthy family to begin with, but to be a slave in Egypt and then to rise and become viceroy, that's one form of rags to riches. But the real rags to riches over here was the fact that Yosef could be somebody who could go through all that he went through and never lose sight of the fact it was all God. He stayed with the program the entire time. And that's why he was so successful. And that's the reason why you know, Hashem allowed him to, to go through and be protected the entire time and, and literally go through like a, a, a swamp with crocodile in a sense, right? And never have to worry about them, just navigate right through because he never lost sight of God in every aspect of his life. No matter how he was tested, no matter what he went through, no matter how much he had the urge to, to satisfy his Yitzhahara. And that's the essence of the Jewish people. And that's what Hanukkah brought out in the Hashmanayim, in Matasyahu. In a, you know, this is what the, the, the ultimate message is because it's about being in Yisrael. In the Zos, Zos Hanukkah, the eighth day, the 36th candle, the Or HaGenuz, you know, all wrapped, there's all this one message where God basically says, if you ascend, you rise to the occasion to go looking for me, I will come down. And I will meet you. In fact, the Vilna Gaon says, when it comes to the final redemption, that's the way it works, right? That that the, the redemption, if we take steps towards redemption, we do whatever we can to put God back into our lives and back into history. I mean, rather, just forget the newspapers. Don't get don't get confused by the headlines. Don't get confused by the stories. Don't let you know reporters you know take your way of thinking and and take it down their path. We have to stand back and say, okay, that's what they're saying. That's what's going on. There. But where is God in all of this? What's what's God saying through, through all of this? That's the perspective. When we're able to do that, then we have fought against men, so to speak, and failed. And that is extremely important for, for expediting the final redemption more peacefully in a way where great miracles happen on behalf of the Jewish people and we don't have to go through any more suffering anymore. Anyhow, I wish you uh, all a wonderful last day of Hanukkah. It's a 36 candle, very special day. So it's Hanukkah, time for tremendous clarity, trying to time to fix things up. Uh, and a Shabbat Shalom as well. Thanks again. On that note, 36 candles. Again, we want to recommend that everyone goes to the 36.org website which is rabbi winston's website and over there you can find an assortment of his books and his shurim and his webinars highly recommended also while you're there we'd also recommend that you go to youtube.com slash israel torah where you can find our organization bring them home which includes many uh many uh videos and shurim also from our winston and others about uh, coming back, the ingathering, the exiles, and coming back to Eretz Israel. We thank you for your, your words of wisdom, and we wish you a Hanukkah Sameach. Thank you. Amen.